Implement the new development concepts. January 18th, 2016. Part of the speech at a study session on implementing the decisions of the 5th plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee, attended by officials at the provincial ministerial level. The key to implementing the new development concepts and turning them into standard practice lies with officials at all levels who must have a correct understanding of the new concepts and act accordingly. Regarding this, I want to emphasize four points. First, officials should set an example by conscientiously studying the new development concepts, and making earnest efforts to apply them to show the strength of these new concepts to other officials and the general public. A clearer understanding of new concepts makes action stronger and more targeted. Footnote 1. The Analects of Ju Shi. Ju Zi Yu Li. Ju Shi. 1130 to 1200, was a Neo-Confucian philosopher of the Southern Song Dynasty. End of footnote one. It takes time to form ideas in people's minds. We must continue to study constantly and at deeper levels to establish the new development concepts consciously and with full confidence. Officials at all levels should strengthen their studies of the new development concepts. They should use history as a reference, make comparisons from different perspectives, and draw insights from realities. They must learn the lessons summarized from our past experiences and mistakes in seeking development, better understand the guiding role of the new concepts of economic and social development, and make efforts to encourage innovation, emphasize coordination, promote green development, further open up, and benefit all the people. I have reiterated that professionalism is a must for officials, reflected in their way of thinking and work methods. It is a must not only in the political sense, but also in the need for new knowledge and professional skills because the new development concepts entail new knowledge, new information, and new requirements of the times. When seeking knowledge, one must know why and how. Footnote 2. Collected Works of Ju Shi Hui An Xian Sheng Ju Wen Gong Wen Ji. End of footnote 2. If we only know some concepts and basic requirements, but have not established a compatible knowledge system, we may know how, but not why, and speak and do things unprofessionally. I always emphasize that officials must be experts in economic and social management. At a time when the market industries and technologies, especially internet technologies, are developing at high speed, officials must increase their competence in economic management. Capital input, production safety, stock market regulation, and internet finance regulation are all areas that involve high risks and require highly skilled management. Misjudgment, poor choices, or weak regulation and control could lead to problems, even major problems, and serious consequences might affect social stability. Over a period of time, a series of major incidents have occurred in the areas of industrial safety, the stock market, and internet finance, sounding the alarm for us. Nowadays, it is not easy to manage economic and social affairs, which involve all kinds of complicated factors. Mistakes are inevitable, but the tuition fee we have paid must be worth it. 
we must learn from our lessons, become wiser the second time, and avoid repeating the same mistakes again. Careful analysis must be made before making investment or engaging in projects and financial activities. Sound judgment must be exercised and the risks must be evaluated. We must not be tempted by money. Streamlining administration and issuing business licenses before giving administrative permits does not mean giving up our control. We should still be in charge of those that need our supervision. The powers delegated from higher levels must be properly exercised by the lower levels. There should not be a power vacuum in between, and different levels of government must perform their due responsibilities. Officials at all levels should study conscientiously, enhance leadership skills, and improve their management capacity. In decision-making and regulation and control, they must continue to uphold principles and perform systemic management with more foresight and creativity. It is not knowledge but action that is difficult to acquire. Footnote 3, Wu Jing, Governance of the Zhengguang Period. Zheng Guan, Zheng Yao, Wu Jing, 670-749, was a historian and official of the Tang Dynasty. End of footnote 3. Both knowledge and action are important, but action is essential. Implementing the new development concepts means that we must change our views on development, expand our knowledge base, and enhance our governing capacity adjust relationships involving competing in interests, and be innovative in, in developing our systems and institutions. The new development concepts should be applied to the whole process of state governance and implemented in our decision-making, policy execution, and examination of various aspects of work. We must strive to enhance our ability to coordinate and implement new development concepts and continue to expand new development. Eloquence is of no value. Real action must be taken to realize these concepts. Officials must put the interests of the state first, develop strategic thinking, and increase their ability in overall and long-term planning. They should not restrict their focus to regional, departmental, or short-term or short -term interests, and should not undermine the interests of the state for partial gains or undermine fundamental interests for temporary gains. Second, we should use dialectical thinking to appropriately plan for the designing and execution of new development concepts. New development concepts have been proposed based on dialectical thinking, which is essential to their implementation. We should adopt a holistic approach and make systematic arrangements by highlighting the integrity and interconnectivity of the new development concepts so that different aspects enhance each other and make progress side by side, avoiding uncoordinated and unbalanced development. We should be capable of separating the main problems from less pressing ones and the main aspects of the problems from the minor aspects so that priorities in action are clarified. While attending to general tasks, we should firmly grip the main problems and their main features and promote holistic progress with breakthroughs in key areas. We should follow the laws of the unity of opposites, the mutual conflict between quality and quantity, and the negation of negation. We should understand the integration of universality and uniqueness, gradualness and leaps and bounds, advancement and twists and turns, and inheritance and innovation. We should be realistic and move forward step by step. At the same time, we must be courageous to advance with the times. In our work, we should apply different methods to solve different issues, depending on the time, location, and conditions. We should be flexible, efficient, and adept at making the best solutions. Third, we should create innovative approaches. 
we should press forward with the implementation of new development concepts through reform and the rule of law, with reform as an engine and the law as firm cornerstone. The establishment of new concepts always comes after the demolition of old traditions. There is no making without breaking. To bring in new concepts, it requires changes in the way we think, act, and work, as well as adjustments in work, social, and interest relations. With no reform but only talking, we will never reach our destination. The Central Committee's plans for further reform are consistent with the new development concepts and officials at all levels must bear the primary responsibility and ensure the implementation of these concepts. During implementation, the principles and requirements set in the Central Committee's reform plans can be elaborated based on the actual conditions. Pilots and trials are encouraged in areas where no specific reform plans are available. No difficulties shall deter us from implementing the plans. Officials should work hard to solve problems, and they should never slacken their efforts. In implementing new development concepts, we must carefully analyze the new requirements for building the rule of law, study the pressing problems in this area, and take targeted measures and thoroughly carry out the new development concepts in accordance with the rule of law. Fourth, we must stay true to our principles and promptly address the problems and risks that arise during the implementation of new development concepts. Developing socialism with Chinese characteristics is an enduring and arduous task, and we must be prepared to fight many great battles with new features Faced by many domestic and international problems, risks, and challenges now and in the future, we must not be off guard. Potential problems, risks, and challenges are intertwined and reinforce each other. If we do not take preventative measures or address them properly, they will add up, escalate, and evolve from minor ones to major ones, from regional ones to to systemic ones, and from international ones to domestic ones. Problems in economic, social, cultural, and environmental areas will transform into political challenges, eventually threatening the party's governance and state security. China's national and social security is the precondition for development that is innovation-driven, coordinated, green, oriented towards global progress, and beneficial to all. Without security and stability, nothing will be accomplished. Wise men take precautionary measures when disaster is brewing. Clever men make estimations about imminent catastrophe. Footnote 4. Pei Songzhi. Annotations in the Records of the Three Kingdoms. Pei Songzhi. 372 to 451 was a historian during the northern and southern dynasties. End of footnote 4. We must be alert and cautious and keep track of small changes that could lead to heavy losses. We should take the initiative and be prepared for risks and challenges in any form. This requires us to be ready for challenges in the fields of economy, politics, culture, society, diplomacy, and military. Every official at every level must take on the responsibility. In his report at the 7th CPC National Congress in 1945, Mao Zedong talked about preparing for the difficulties challenging China at the time. 1. International hostility. 2. Domestic hostility. 3. Several main bases had been taken by the KMT. 4. Some 10,000 soldiers had been killed by the KMT. 5. The puppet troops had welcomed Chiang Kai-shek. 6. A civil war had broken out. 7. We have our own Ronald Scobie, who is trying to turn China into Greece. 8. Not recognizing Poland 
In other words, the status of the Communist Party had not been recognized. 9. Some 10,000 party members had either defected or lost contact with party organizations. 10. Some party members had become tired and pessimistic. 11. Catastrophic natural disasters had struck. 12. Economic difficulties. 13. The enemy had deployed its main force in North China. 14. The KMT had been assassinating our comrades at leading positions. 15. Disputes in the party's leadership. 16. We had to do without help from international proletariat organizations. And 17. Other unpredictable difficulties. He said, Many things cannot be predicted, but we, especially senior leading cadres, must be prepared to tackle extremely difficult situations and adversity. We must be clear-headed about this. Footnote 5. Mao Zedong. Conclusions at the 7th National Congress of the CPC. Collected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 3, Chinese Edition, People's Publishing House, Beijing, 1996, page 392. End of footnote 5. Deng Xiaoping also said, At the same time, we should base our work on the possible emergence of serious problems and prepare for them. In this way, even if the worst should happen, the sky will not fall. Footnote 6. Deng Xiaoping, we should draw on the experience of other countries. Selected works of Deng Xiaoping, Volume 3, English Edition, Foreign Languages Press, Beijing, 1994, page 262. End of footnote 6. Similar approaches, shared by Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao, are all important political experience and wisdom in party and state governance. Lastly, I want to emphasize that we need to mobilize officials in a more extensive and effective manner. This is of vital significance and is a pressing task now. Officials are the backbone of our party's cause. Overall, our officials are becoming increasingly capable, and the composition of officials is now more balanced, with many young officials growing more experienced in office. However, complexities do exist in our leading ranks. Affected by their own experience or the social and political environment, some officials are distracted and inactive in performing their duties. This is a pressing problem, and we must pay attention to it. We need to find out the root causes and come up with targeted solutions. According to reports from various sources, official nonfeasance is caused by, first, incapability, second, lack of motivation, and third, lack of courage and a sense of responsibility. This is not new, but why is it an emergency now? One reason is that some officials have not caught up with the new situation, finding themselves unfit for the new tasks and requirements. The other lies in our work and complex factors and influences in the society. In some local governments and units, the measures and supporting policies to implement the Central Committee's plans are yet to be put in place, and adjustment is needed in order to ensure that the guiding principles are correctly understood. Our officials need time to understand the decisions and plans of the central leadership. And our party organizations need to offer timely guidance to the officials. In some localities and units, there has been insufficient adjustment, or none at all, for guiding developments in theoretical studies, principles, conduct, and the economy and society, as required by the decisions made since the party's 18th National Congress. All this has hampered adaptation to the new requirements in wider society. Unhealthy tendencies have shaken the conviction of some officials, leaving them in doubt. It is agreed by all that official nonfeasance in some individuals has become a pressing concern. Party committees at all levels should not wait or vacillate. 
they should take targeted measures to solve the problem. We need to strengthen education for officials. To fill their gaps in knowledge, experience, and ability, officials should take lessons in theory, policy, science, and technology, management, and laws and regulations with the focus on actual needs and effectiveness. In this way, they will be more motivated, their doubts addressed, their sense of responsibility reinforced, and their confidence in and capacity to work under the new situation strengthened. In practice, we should be strict and disciplined while giving due attention to the needs of officials. Officials must conscientiously perform their duties as required by party organizations and faithfully follow the party's principles and disciplines. They must not abuse their power in violation of the law. Party organizations should encourage and support the work of officials, ensure their legitimate income and subsidies, and pay attention to their psychological needs so that they can fully, actively, and confidently apply themselves to their work. Should errors occur, distinctions, distinctions should be made between the following cases. Mistakes due to a lack of experience in pushing pilot reform programs and deliberate violations of the law and party discipline. Mistakes due to trial efforts not specifically banned by higher level authorities and violations of the law and party discipline with full knowledge of the prohibitions. Unintentional mistakes for the good of development and violations of the law and party discipline for personal gain. Those who are honest, upright, and dare to take new approaches must be protected, so that officials will be fully motivated to lead the people in building a moderately prosperous society as scheduled and break new ground for socialist modernization. The New Normal of Economic Development Economic work should be adapted to the new normal. December 9th, 2014. Part of the speech at the Central Conference on Economic Work. To improve our economic work, first of all, we should have a rational understanding of the current situation and a sound assessment of future trends. Recently, there have been comments both in and outside China. As China's economic growth slows down, is there anything wrong? The growth rate has dropped to below 7.5%. Why not take stimulus measures? I think that to look at and analyze this question, we must understand China's various economic development stages from the historical and dialectical viewpoint. Last year, the central government decided that China's economic development is at a stage of shifting the growth rate, restructuring the economy, and addressing the impact of previous stimulus policies. In the middle of this year, at a meeting of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee, I further analyzed this complex economic stage, emphasizing that our economic work should be adapted to the new normal. Not long ago, at the 2014 APEC CEO Summit in Beijing, I briefly analyzed the characteristics of the new normal in China's economic development. A slowdown in the rate of growth, optimization of economic structure, and shift of growth engines. Here, through comparison, I would like to talk about several trends brought by the new normal. First, consumption. Consumption in China used to flow in waves, as large numbers of consumers would follow the latest fad in an attempt to keep up with the Joneses. Now, this sheep flock effect has disappeared and the stage of consumption in waves 
has ended. Differentiated, individualized, and diversified consumption has become the norm. There is more emphasis on product quality and safety, and demand stimulated by innovative supply is growing in importance. Since incomes have improved and the pattern of consumption has changed, adjustments in the supply system are imperative. Moreover, the 1.3 billion Chinese have tremendous potential to improve their overall consumption capacity. We must adopt sound policies to release consumption potential, allowing consumption to continue to drive economic development. Second, investment. China used to have a huge demand in investment. As long as we had funds and entrepreneurship, we always gained investment returns. Investment was vital to economic growth. Now, through over 30 years of high-intensive and large-scale development and construction, investment in traditional industries and real estate has reached capacity. But infrastructure connectivity, new technologies, new products, new industries, and new business models present new investment opportunities and demand new means of investment and financing. China's gross saving rate remains high. We must find the right direction and eliminate barriers for investment so that investment can continue to boost economic growth. Third, export and balance of payments. Before the global financial crisis, international markets were expanding rapidly. As long as there were cost advantages, exports could be expanded. Exports were a major engine for China's rapid economic growth. Now, since global aggregate demand is sluggish, China's comparative low cost advantage is receding. China is still competitive in exports, and its share in international markets gained through years of effort is an important resource. At one and the same time, China is going out on a greater scale and bringing in products of higher technology. The renminbi is now well received and circulated internationally. The current account surplus and capital account surplus are approaching balances between revenues and expenditures. We must foster new comparative edges. We must vigorously participate in revising the rules of international trade and investment so that our exports can continue to support economic growth. Fourth, production capacity and industrial structure China's main problem used to be undersupply. Now, the supply capacity of traditional industries has exceeded demand. The industrial capacity of steel, cement, and glass industries is approaching a peak. Real estate is facing structural and regional overcapacity, and the planned construction area of development zones, industrial parks, and new urban districts has exceeded actual demand. Confronting overcapacity, we must upgrade our industrial structure, merge and reorganize enterprises, and promote concentration of production. IT technology developing quickly in innovative directions, emerging industries, service industries, small and micro businesses are playing a more prominent role. Small-scale, intelligent, and specialized production will become a new feature of industrial structure. Fifth, the comparative advantages of production factors. China used to have a wealth of new labor and surplus rural labor. Our low labor cost was our biggest advantage. Introduced technologies and management were were quickly transformed into productivity. Now, due to population aging, 
The gross working age population is falling in number. Rural surplus labor is decreasing. The level of technology innovation in many fields is lagging behind that of our advanced international competitors. Deprived of key technology for upgrading the economy, we suffer from weakened influence of production factors. As the quality of production factors improves, economic growth will rely more on the quality of human capital and progress in technology. So innovation must become a new growth engine. Sixth, market competition. Increases in quantity and price competition used to dominate. Now, it is turning to competition in quality and product differentiation. Consumers tend to value quality and individualized products, so we must identify potential demand and meet it through innovative supply. Enterprises acquire competitive edge through preferential policies on taxation and land use. The policy of preferential taxation on foreign-funded enterprises over domestic enterprises can no longer be sustained. Therefore, a single national market and high resource allocation efficiency are essential to economic development. We must drive deeper reform and opening up and develop a single, transparent, well-organized, and procedure-based market environment so as to create favorable conditions for full market competition. Seventh, resource and environment constraints. China used to have sufficient energy and resources and extensive eco-space which allowed large-scale and rapid development. Now, the carrying capacity of our environment is approaching or has reached the limit and there is no longer the potential for high-consuming, extensive development. The people are desperate for clean air and water, a healthy environment, and other eco-products, so the eco-environment is becoming increasingly valuable. We must meet the public demand for a good eco-environment and promote a new eco-friendly and low-carbon development model and thereby create new growth areas. Eighth, the accumulation and diffusing of risks. China's rapid economic growth has indeed concealed certain conflicts and risks. Now, as the growth rate slows down, hidden risks are becoming evident. Local government risks concerning debt, shadow banking, and real estate are becoming apparent, Structural risks also exist in employment. These risks come from excessive government intervention in economic restructuring, from blind investment by market entities during economic prosperity, from excessive promises due to short-sightedness, or from the shock of the global financial crisis. From a holistic view, the risks confronting us are under control, but we need some time to diffuse threats in the form of high leverage and economic bubbles. We must find the correct prescriptions to treat both symptoms and root causes. Establish and improve the mechanisms to diffuse the various risks we face. And mitigate the shock of one-off risks by giving ourselves the time to deal with them. When threatened, by systemic risks. We should operate on such risks as if we were carrying out surgery. Ninth, the resource allocation model and the means of macroeconomic control. China used to have growth potential in aggregate demand. Keynesian economics alone were effective in stimulating China's economic development. Our shortcomings in economic growth were quite evident, and following the flying geese paradigm implemented by pioneering countries, our industrial policies were capable of developing comparative advantages. Now, from the perspective of demand, the marginal effects of comprehensive stimulus policies are diminishing. 
from the perspective of supply, we should resolve overcapacity on the one hand and use market mechanisms to identify the future direction for industrial development on the other. We must be fully aware of the changes in the demand-supply relationship. We must conduct reasonable macroeconomic control. We must conduct proper and targeted intervention. We must take resolute and moderate measures when necessary. We must balance our efforts to invigorate the market and create a favorable environment. In this way, we can form a new growth model which can balance the roles of market and government intervention. In this complex economic situation, the above-mentioned changes indicate that China's growth rate will definitely drop, but within acceptable limits. Economic restructuring will be painful, but is unavoidable. Addressing the impact of previous incentive policies is necessary, and the impact from various risks can be mitigated and diffused through effective guidance. All this confirms that China's economy is evolving to a model that is more advanced, better structured, and with more complicated division of labor. These changes are both the features and the causes of the new normal. Some might be reinforced, others might be amended. In general, since China entered the new normal of economic development, its growth rate has shifted from 10% to about 7%, from high speed to medium high speed. The growth pattern is changing from large scale and high speed extensive growth to high quality and efficient intensive growth. The economic structure is being transformed from quantitative increase and expanding capacity to adjusting stock while optimizing increment. Growth engines are turning from traditional areas to new ones. Entering the new normal manifests the inevitable periodic nature of China's economic development. Understanding the new normal, adapting ourselves to the new normal, and guiding the new normal are major tasks in the present and future stages of our economic development. Limitations lead to change. Changes lead to solutions. Solutions lead to development. Footnote 1. Book of Changes. Yi Jing. End of footnote 1. We should be adaptive as we face the new normal. We should fully understand it, adopt the right measures, and make concrete efforts so as to keep pace with the times in our economic work. We must have a deep and shared understanding of the new normal. It is simplistic to regard economic development merely as quantitative change and repetition. We should think and act according to the decisions of the Central Committee, enhancing our awareness and creating the initiative to accelerate the transformation of the economic growth model. If we fail to see the new changes, new situations, and new problems, or even worse, deny them, and if we stick to the old extensive and high-speed development model and launch projects impulsively, that is a sign that we cannot keep up with the new situation. The old way might raise the rate of growth, but it will not work for long. On the contrary, it will simply intensify and ultimately ignite the conflicts accumulated in development. Facing the new normal, we should take proactive measures to boost development. As I have repeatedly emphasized, Taking economic development as the central task is vital to national rejuvenation. Development is the CPC's top priority in governance, the basis and the key to resolving all the country's problems. Moreover, I have also emphasized repeatedly that what we need is quality, profitability, and sustainable development. 
What we need is development supported by full employment, high productivity, high investment returns, and high resource allocation efficiency. We cannot measure development simply by GDP. Therefore, we will have to carry out our economic work properly and estimate the economic situation correctly. It is not true that if growth speeds up, the economic situation is good, and if growth slows down, the economic situation is bad. Actually, it is normal for the rate of growth to rise and fall. The rules of economic development do not permit zero economic fluctuation. As long as any fluctuation is within an acceptable range, we should remain calm, noting that we have the initiative to take macroeconomic measures. We should stay alert against peril, but we must not overreact. Note this well. China has entered the new normal of economic development. This does not alter the fact that we have a strategic opportunity to accomplish great deeds. What it changes is the content and conditions of this strategic opportunity. This does not negate the overall favorable trend in our economic growth. What it changes is our growth model and economic structure. As to the changes in conditions for development, we must have an accurate, in-depth, and thorough understanding and act when conditions permit. We must improve the quality and the benefits of growth and accelerate strategic economic restructuring. We must satisfy the people's demands, improve our analysis of market and consumer psychology, and upgrade our guidance of social expectations. We must strengthen the protection of property rights and intellectual property rights, explore the talent of entrepreneurs, and improve education and the quality of our human capital. We must promote ecological progress, advances in science and technology, and all-round innovation. To achieve these, the key lies in our efforts to drive deeper reform, to implement the strategy of innovation-driven development, and to resolve problems in development. Therefore, we must advance reform and innovation, accelerate the transformation of the growth model, and make concrete efforts to adapt our growth engines so as to open up a new social and economic situation at a new historical threshold.